Hello everyone, welcome to the Share Your Green Design podcast. Before we begin today's episode, just a reminder that you can follow and subscribe to us over on Spotify, Apple, or wherever you get your podcasts. And you can also find the full video version of each episode over on YouTube. We're also on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and WeChat at Share Your Green Design. That's all one word, Share Your Green Design. And remember, the podcast is only one small part of what is an ever-growing platform. So head on over to shareyourgreendesign.com to keep up to date with the latest in sustainable architecture, engineering, and construction. We've got projects, news, research, events, competitions, student work, jobs, everything you need. We'd love to have you as a visitor, but also as a contributor. So you're always welcome to send us your own projects, ideas, events, job openings, and much more. You'll find all the details on shareyourgreendesign.com. Once again, that's shareyourgreendesign.com. Thank you again for your support. And with that, we hope you enjoyed today's episode. Okay, hello. Um, Hi. So thanks for joining me today, Piers, uh, uh, to talk about architecture and materials and all things sustainability. Uh, just as a short intro about myself, um, my name is Fanos. I'm one of the co-founders of 2050 Materials. We are building a platform for the architecture sector to be able to assess and find sustainable building products. And yeah, I'm super excited to have a chat about all of the things that are interesting around your work today. Um, Great. Well, thanks, maybe, thanks maybe, yeah. No, go for it. Uh, feel free to, to do an intro as well. Okay, so um, thanks for having me. I'm Piers Taylor. I am an architect. Uh, I'm the founder of Invisible Studio. Uh, I teach um, and I'm a researcher. I have a PhD in uh, um, really in a sort of making and how making as a social practice. Um, and I also, in fact, manage a hundred acre woodland in the west uh, of the United Kingdom, which we use as a, a kind of sketchbook for practice. So super excited to be here today to talk about uh, uh, some of those things and other things really to do with materials. And, you know, I think it's a really complex world. I mean, I think what's most interesting about architecture is that it's um, no choice can be made in isolation. Architecture is interesting because of the way it links to the world and we can never make simple cho simple choices. So how we navigate through the kind of complex decision-making around materials, I think is really, really interesting. I would definitely agree. Uh, I think uh, one thing that I'm realizing also through my work is that, or generally speaking, I think people have a, a certain uh, aversion to complexity Although when it comes to architecture and when it comes to the materials we're using for something that's been standard for potentially hundreds of years, I think complexity is almost necessary to consider. So yeah. it's great to hear from, from you as well that, you know, there's no, we're not just going for the simplest solution and we're not just having tunnel visions on specific things like cost or carbon or whatever it might be yeah. when we're looking about or talking about materials. Yeah. I mean, you know, um, I mean, as, as whatever one might think about it, Bill Gates uh, think about Bill Gates, he said, okay, let's go carbon neutral tomorrow. Does that mean we're not going to put a roof over anyone's head in the developing world from this point on? You know, there's the kind of consequences and we're always making judgments, always weighing up um, conflicting issues of, uh, of, you know, the social world, people's lives, people's immediate like, but, but also the well-being of the planet, you know, and um, issues of affordability, um all of those things all the time mm -hmm. and i think i think you bring about a very good point because the development of of the less wealthy countries in the context of sustainable development is a huge yeah. topic that we often yeah. tend to forget especially in the western world and in central europe when we're talking about mm -hmm. you know reducing our emissions and reducing maybe even the the growth rate of our economies whereas all of the countries that have not caught up yet yeah. with the with the wealth creation obviously mm. are not mm. necessarily thinking the same thing yeah yeah um so yeah, shall i go straight be... into some, some of the questions that you've um, yeah. already primed me with i mean one of the one of the questions is how did we or how did i i suppose start invisible studio and i think you know i i studied in australia originally with 
Glenn Merkert, who is an extraordinary architect and, you know, way ahead of the curve in terms of thinking about modest, uh, passively ventilated buildings that sat in a context which was ecologically fragile. You know, so he would always talk about, um, you know, the water table, wind, sunlight, weather, you know, all of those things before he started talking about a building, you know, the building would then touch the ground incredibly lightly and disturb as little as possible. And I think he was an extraordinary person to study with for many ways, in many ways. I mean, I think his mode of practice was interesting, you know, and I, so I studied with him and I came back to, to England where I'd grown up with um, parents that weren't originally from England actually, but I grew up here, came back here, I guess, in, uh, the mid nineties and, you know, I went to the AA to do my part two, you know, when I talked about those things, interestingly, they said, talked about weather and climate, you know, and they said, there's none of that here. You know, the issues in the United Kingdom then were, uh, were, or in terms of architecture were defined by the formal concerns of architecture, you know, how you, um, worked within the sort of theoretical field of architecture. And in a way, you know, I realized that, of course, there was weather here, you know, I mean, it happened that it was mainly nine degrees and drizzling, but increasingly, weather has become a really important part of, you know, the way we work in the United Kingdom, you cannot ignore it. It's extremely hot. Sometimes it was 40 degrees this summer. Um, it has extreme rainfall at times, you know, the quality of the weather, I think, affects everything. And, but in any case, I, I, Glenn gave me a really amazing roadmap and I, and I, and I sort of slightly lost my way when I came back. And in, I think 2001, I saw, uh, it must've been in the early days of the internet, I must've got an email just as the internet was sort of starting and, um, from, uh, somebody telling me about the Glenn Merck at Masterclass, you know, in Australia in 2001. So I went back to Australia to do this Masterclass with Glenn in uh, Riversdale, south of Sydney, in this extraordinary landscape, the Shoalhaven River, in a building that we, you know, lived and stayed in that was very connected to, to where it was environmentally. And that redirected my life. And I came back and bought the house that we still live in that that is a house that um, you have to, well, you used to have to walk down to through woodland. So you're incredibly connected to the natural world um, just by virtue of, you know, going in and out of your front door, those kind of things. And um, built an, another house uh, or extended the house, you know, uh, to make um, the building again that we kind of still live in, that, that tried to do some of the things I'd learned with Glenn. And I, I then, I started a practice way, way back then and always knowing it wasn't how I wanted to, to practice really. It was a, it was a, um, an organization that needed to bring work in that we didn't particularly want to do in order to survive. And um, I'd, I'd started to do really interesting work with the Architecture Association in their woodland at Hook Park with students where we'd take materials from the woodland, from the forest and use it in construction through testing and prototyping. And, and typically that was timber. And uh, we also then bought the woods around uh, the house that we live in. We, we bought the, the, the forest. And I realized that I wanted to practice in a different way. Um, and, you know, we'd started this summer school in 2005, in fact, called Studio in the Woods, which I'd always described as an invisible studio. You know, there was no infrastructure. People just came together to make buildings or to make stuff when the, when the, when the, when the you know, conditions were right. And then they kind of dissipated. There was no, you know, there was no studio. It was just an invisible studio of people coming together. And I went back to Australia in 2009. Um, to just rethink what I wanted to do and reconnected with Glenn Merkert, Richard Laplastrier, who um, is a, a, a contemporary of Glenn's, lived in an extraordinary, you know, small uh, exploded campsite, as Peter Carey called it, connected to its context. Um, and these were people super engaged with where buildings kind of were, which I thought was really interesting. And I realized that I just couldn't go back to my previous practice. So I, you know, re resigned from my own practice and set up this thing called Invisible Studio, which um, really was, was, was a kind of anti-practice. It was just um, a way of 
doing work without the kind of infrastructure and the baggage of formal practice. And, um, you know, finished some buildings for um, that we were doing for the AA and then in a way then built this building, the studio that I'm in now um, speaking to you from, which was in a, in a way a kind of manifesto for how we wanted to work, which was um, in, a, in a very sketchy manner, working with people in a way that was outside of formal architecture and these you know we built the studio just with the trees taken from the actual site of the building that were going to come out as part of a forest management plan because we're returning everything to broadleaf and you know we took out these larch trees and though that was all the material we had we didn't have any other uh, timber and we made our own scaffolding we scavenged the windows we scavenged the insulation and it was a kind of it was an architecture of frugality in some ways it was a sort of real essay i hope in making with what you have and what we had was those trees what we had was just the infrastructure of people that lived around us my neighbors and so on and that's how we did the building and again we did the drawings that we needed to communicate with those people who had no formal training at all um and you know for me it set out an ambition to work slightly outside or on the fringes of mainstream architecture and then you know then we started to do more buildings that were sort of infused with that ethos and we started to do buildings for the forestry commission the national arboretum western Burt, where we showed them how to do buildings with their people in their context with their timber made in a kind of different um manner and, you know, in a way, I'm sort of moving on slightly to the, the next question, which is the principles around how we work. And I think how we work, we work in lots of different contexts, lots of different ways. But I suppose, you know, one of the things, I guess, that does define the work I enjoy doing is, you know, historically, if you look at what architects do, they work within a site boundary. And, you know, they're given a site typically and, you know, you can't step outside that site and your client has no interest in anything outside that site. Typically, what we're interested in is how the thing that's inside the site can inform the, the, the context outside the site. So we always ask our ourselves, what's the territory of this project? What can this project do? What's it? What are the consequences of this project? What does it inform? What does it change? So there always has to be another story other than just you know, talking about what shape and colour something is and making something, you know, that's formally interesting. I'm not, you know, forms are interesting, but they're also quite boring and they get boring pretty quickly. And so the work always has to be about something else, I guess. Um, yeah. Yeah, that's very, very interesting. And I guess one thing I pick up on from what you said is you, you kind of started out by saying the studio was a way to do an anti-practice, although... Yeah. To me, some of the some of the principles behind the studio sound very much like what historically has been happening in architecture. Maybe not the formal architecture that we know today, but working within the restrictions of a certain environment is very much how people have been building for hundreds of years. So I, I guess I hear one way of turning back to that as kind of a, a way to, to remind the, the more formal practices of architecture that this is kind of the way that it has been happening. And although the reasons are different why we might want to do that now, it's still a very valid way to think about how to build up new structures and set up new homes and, and, and offices and anything that we might be Completely. spending our Completely. times in. Completely. I mean, I think all of the buildings that we've done here in the woodland, I mean, the woodlands that I've described, you know, we do use as a sketchbook for practice and we've built you know five or six other buildings in in the, the woods that are more evolved than this but they each just look at um the resource we have you know and they take that resource and we don't go shopping for new stuff partly because we don't can't afford it and partly because we don't really want to you know we just work with what we have and um given that we manage or, or uh, you know the manage is a kind of loose word because we don't really do much to the woodland we just take out trees that are typically non-native and use them uh often we mill them without knowing what we're going to do with them so we mill them into a, the most efficient timber section that we can think you know and then we just you know so some years later we might just work out what we can do with that resource when we come to make another building and you know we don't go shopping for new stuff and we don't get frustrated if that material you know can't do what we want to do because we work with that material to find out 
you know, what it is we can do with that material. And it, we don't just think of an idealized form and then just try and apply a material to it. And I think, you know, you're absolutely right that historically, you know, in, in, if we look at most of the buildings that architects didn't do, that's exactly how people work. They just work with what they had and they didn't just, you know, think of a shape and then go shopping for material and then work out well that material is expensive carbon hungry unavailable whatever it is they just they just work with what they had and you know that's really a really interesting way of working i think um where there is a relationship between material and place and you know pre-industrial revolution it was super easy because you just took what you you had and you couldn't transport material you know from one place to the next and as you move around particularly europe if you move around you know you look at the ground and you always see the buildings above it you know always and you move off that that seam of stone or clay or whatever it is and immediately the buildings will change you know and except for the buildings that are culturally distinct and important and then there might be something else that's brought in because that building warranted it and you know so I think buildings that tell stories about the places are really, really interesting. And, and as you say, you know, that was easy pre-industrial revolution. Post-industrial re revolution, where you can get anything from anywhere, it becomes much more complex because, you know, to what extent do you acknowledge, you know, um, the way things used to be? Just to do things the way things used to be because that's how they were done isn't a very interesting way of working. But using materials in ways that tell stories and speak of places, speak of things that are distinct is really, really interesting, I think. And, you know, there's the, if they're complex stories to tell still because, you know, we come with the baggage of knowing as architects that there are other ways of telling stories, which are, you know, the international style or the modern movement that tried to say that, well, we can do any building anywhere, and it's always, which is one global population, which I, you know, on, on one hand, I, I have some sympathy with because I'm just not interested in national boundaries. I'm not interested in culture wars. I, I have no interest in, you know, the, the, the horrors of Brexit that was a kind of small minded nationalistic, you know, desire to reclaim an artificial distinction based around a cultural identity. You know, I, I have no interest. I have far more in common with, you know, people who are French because they're my near neighbors in the south of England than I do with people in the north of it, you know, et cetera, et cetera. And I, you know, think of myself as fundamentally European and, you know, I work all over Europe and England. So, so the, the, but, you know, with that, places are really, really, really interesting. Distinct ways of doing things from an anthropological manner, from an architectural manner, are really fascinating. And there's nothing more interesting than going to a place and eating a certain type of food because it came from there or seeing a certain type of, you know, music or custom or technique or craft or architecture um, that's rooted in a place. It's really, really interesting. How you carry on doing it is complex because they're evolving traditions. You don't just do what people did in the past. It's always an evolved or evolving way of working, I think. Yeah, absolutely. And uh, I guess from my side, I, as I mentioned, I live in Greece and often I, I travel to the islands and it's always very interesting to see, you know, specific islands with the type of stone that they have and the type of techniques that they have been building, which obviously are partially dependent on the materials that are available and partially just dependent on the skill force that was available that knows how to use them. Sure. Um, right. And, and in, in conversations that I've had recently about that, a lot of architects I, I know in this area, so who are building primarily residential uh, buildings in islands, they're seeing the change happening in the islands where you might have stone from Sandorini being shipped to, to the Ionian Sea and kind of replicates a house that kind of looks like an island house, but is not really local and potentially is sure. unnecessary to be built there yeah. because there's other materials that are uh, kind of inherent and local. Of course. And, and actually and, it uh, is hard. I mean, I, you know, I, went to a, yeah. I went to a house in Spain uh, that was in the basalt region. And I asked, where does the basalt come from? Where's the quarry? And they said, well, it's actually Mongolia because it's like so expensive to get um, material um, from here, you know, that's one of the difficulties. And I think, you know, but of course, it's not just twice as um, carbon hungry, it's probably 10 times as carbon hungry to ship materials. And actually, that's the new uh, distinction that we make is that, you know, moving materials around the globe is really um, expensive in carbon terms, it may be cheaper, um, because they're mass produced or low quality or whatever, but it's really expensive in carbon terms. I mean, it's like, you know, um, it's like eating, you know, uh, 
um, you know, uh, green beans in winter from Zimbabwe or wherever. It's kind of, you know, it's it's crazy. And exactly. I think, you know, it, it's more and more and more, as we know, the embodied energy of material is the consideration for um, uh, talking about low energy buildings. So historically, 20 years ago, and I, I think this statistic is right, because I was told by uh, somebody who knows a lot more about these things than I do, that 20, 20 years ago, uh, in terms of the carbon footprint of a building, 20% of it was materials, 80% of it was the operational you know, energy of you know, uh, running, the heating the building. But largely, we've, we've solved that, or cooling in your case, largely in this country, we've solved um, that. And that's been reversed. And now it's 80% about the embodied energy of materials. So um, how we heat a building has largely been solved through insulation, through understanding building physics, through air tightness. All of those things have changed immeasurably in 20 years. You were saying yeah. that, uh, you know, the transportation impacts of shipping products is a huge aspect of what, what is happening right now. And potentially we're not considering so much the, the carbon footprint, essentially, of doing that. Uh, and it's sometimes... I would say tempting for for projects to do that because it's just cheaper. So the way the economy works today, it sometimes might actually make sense economically speaking. But obviously, that's a that's a huge uh, topic. Um, I guess one question I had with regards to you know the the approaches that you use at Invisible Studio, but also the approaches you talked about earlier is. Um, it strikes me that, uh, you know, back to the discussion of developing countries and places that need to grow to house new population, is there, do you, do you think that the, the, the approaches of past architecture where we're really looking at what resources are available in one location still have space in the, let's say, large growth that needs to happen in a lot of developing countries or even in some developed countries where a lot of people are moving into cities? Yeah, I do. And I think that, um, so, I mean, the first thing is that, um, so concrete is clearly a, a, a material that has a huge negative impact on um, the planet. And part of the reason for the negative impact is not necessarily that carbon itself is inherently um, uh, um, uh, carbon hungry, it's actually kilo for kilo, quite a low uh, carbon material. It's the quantity that's used. And one day we will eliminate cement from all concrete. That What we can do in the moment is to minimize the amount of, of concrete and cement that we use. And and I think, you know, that, that it's very difficult in high rise buildings to minimize um, you know, uh, or, or eight story buildings to minimize um, uh, or take out cement completely at the moment. But I think we can take out something like 80% of the cement that we use um, almost overnight. It would make very little difference. So the, the problem with concrete is the amount that is used or cement rather. It's the amount that is used unthinking that is the problem. And, you know, I've worked in New Zealand where, you know, they have this expression, just tilt slab buildings because it's cheap. They make uh, slabs on the ground. They tilt them up, you know, and they make sort of low rise um you know, buildings like that. It's kind of crazy um, to do that. So I'm just going to kill this. Uh, it's crazy to use concrete for those type of applications, you know. So um, the, the question, though, is in the developing world, what can we do? And we're working in the, in the Middle East where what we are trying to do is look at the materials they have. And they don't have that much timber, but they do have a lot of earth. So, you know, can earth technology in those contexts, for example, um, allow um, or find its way into contemporary development issues that are primarily how in you know three generations we've gone from two percent urbanized to over 50 percent you know absolutely it can you know it absolutely it can because if you look at what cities need typically they need build need buildings that are six stories or less and you know actually so they're relatively low uh that they're, they're high density but they're not buildings that are 50 stories, you know, and 
um, the, the efficiencies of using materials like earth and stone and timber can absolutely be used in making the cities and places that we need in the developing world. And I think in energy terms, as soon as you start going over six stories, things start getting um, really complex from an energy perspective, you know, getting up and down them, those kind of things. But six stories, you know, more than two stories, less than six stories, can uh, timber, earth and stone and low carbon materials play a part? A absolutely, absolutely. And I think, you know, yeah. part of what we need to do is look at technologies and materials that places have and then work out how to harness those in a 21st century application. So, you know, in uh, the Middle East, we're looking at 3D printing earth um, with a binder. Um, to make um, bigger buildings that fit within, you know, existing settlements. Um, so, you know, clearly there is a, a way that we need to use um, materials from places because the transport costs are enormous, you know. Um, and there is the, yeah. this question of provenance where, you know, how materials can continue to speak of places, you know. Yeah. Absolutely. I mean, I guess I was alluding a little bit to, to something I feel, I feel also very strongly about, but I, I'm quite optimistic actually about a lot of the technologies that are coming out there. And partially that's because of, you know, my work that I do at 2050 materials, but I guess we see more and more that there's very innovative companies trying to build, uh, or trying to create building materials that are actually used to expand cities that need to expand in a way that we're not we're not uh, emitting a lot of carbon footprint or in a way that we're creating circular materials. So I guess I wanted to hear your view on that because I personally think that even though sometimes it's a, it's, it's a statement that's being made about the growth of economies and, and it's being made in a way to suggest that carbon emissions cannot really be cut down by growing uh, cities. I actually think that we have enough technology and enough, enough um, low carbon materials so that we can be smart about it and still grow those places with considerations that we have not taken in the Western world. So I think it's actually more of an opportunity, it seems to me, to show that development can happen in a more sustainable format than it has happened in the past. Completely. I mean, I think, you know, the other problem in a way is people are just so lazy in terms of how they use materials. I mean, I think, you know, um, sealing up a building and, uh, uh, in a in a benign climate and having using lots of glass and uh, concrete, it's just kind of lazy. I mean, you know, in my, in my way, in my point is that it's it's difficult to take all cement out overnight from projects in the developing world where development is happening incredibly quickly. Um, but you really can take out. Um, 80 percent you could reduce your carbon footprint i think by 80 percent overnight taking out um carbon hungry materials where you really don't need them taking out um uh you know glass on south elevations where um you you know you don't need or minimizing you know glass or recessing making you know deep reveals with shaded openings you know maximizing um cross ventilation you know all of the things that you can just do easily and simply um, with rules of thumb um, in you know the developing world are absolutely the things that we should be doing whilst we move towards um, a carbon neutral and carbon zero future and it's the sort of sheer laziness of building that is the most distressing thing where we know we have alternatives and we know we can do something else and you know the building envelope is just designed to leak um uh you know air to leak um uh cool for heat depending on you know where you are um to uh, re-radiate heat um not to use ventilation strategies properly i mean it's just you know it's kind of extraordinary really um and you know I even in parts of southern europe that i go to very regularly which are hot seeing air-conditioned buildings with big glass facades facing south is crazy i mean it's absolutely crazy and those are the types of things that we really can make a difference um, as architects um, uh, overnight and we have the materials with which we can do it um, uh, you know so uh, you know really can we be making a difference in cities yes 
Yeah, that's great to hear. That's a, a nice, uh, that's good to hear that, you know, there's a lot of things also from simply just thinking about the, even where the building is facing and what kind of materials we're using for the facade that really already make huge difference in terms of both the operational yeah. emissions as well as the materials that we're using. Completely. I mean, um, you know, I think the other thing is that so we've got out of the habit of um, thinking about a building as an active system. And I think, you know, one of the things that Glenn Merkert said was that a building is like a boat. You know, you sail it, you adjust it, you move it, you acknowledge what the weather is doing and you, you know, you, you open it up, you shut it down, you kind of move it. And I think, you know, we're, we're so or as culturally becoming used to buildings that <clears throat> just are inert and, you know, they're, they're constantly set at 19 degrees. We do nothing and the building just kind of does its thing. I think in a way that's a real shame that um, because I think, you know, part of developing an environmental sensibility is acknowledging where you are. You acknowledge where you are mm. through an acknowledgement of what the weather is and how you operate and you take responsibility for opening up windows, allowing air in or closing buildings down to keep air out or keep sun out, whatever it is. And that's, that's I think, a really interesting way of engaging with the world, you know. Um, I mean, I think, you know, moving on to healthy materials. I mean, one of the things we're looking at is using hemp, uh, hemp in construction. Mm -hmm. And um, in, a, in this country, it's very hard to build a single skin or because of issues of damp and cavity and, you know, uh, cold bridging. But with hemp, it is possible. And, you know, using hempcrete um, is a really healthy way of making a building where the building does breathe and can breathe. And, you know, one of the distressing things we've been reading about recently is the amount of mold in buildings where buildings are badly designed. They're black mold, which is unhealthy and um, building with materials that breathe and are healthy clearly is another good thing for us. Clearly, timber does that. One of the reasons we work so much with timber is that it is such a fantastic material um, that uh, in terms of the benefits that it gives you, um, you know, psychologically, culturally, as well as, of course, um, environmentally. Yeah, that's that's um, that's a super important topic. I think one thing we I, I have seen a lot in a lot of the discussions that have been lately is that this I mean architects, but also interior designers who are talking to their clients about sustainability and ethical sourcing and health they are realizing that all of these topics overlap to a very big extent. So it's not just about reducing carbon or it's not just about uh, building or designing with healthy materials. It's often specific decisions can actually increase the number of benefits to the client or to whoever will be using that building just by changing one material for another. And I think hemp is a very good example of something that, you know, it's not, it's not revolutionary in the sense that the world has been using hemp to a very big extent to make textiles, to make all kinds of, of materials. So it's very, it's very inspiring, I guess, for me to see that, you know, those kind of materials can feed into the buildings that we, we live in and they help us solve the climate crisis and also help us just live healthier lives and often make us feel better as well. Yeah. I mean, abso um, absolutely. And, I mean, I think, um, you know, Sorry, go ahead. No, I was, I, I, I think um, I was echoing uh, what you were saying in that um, most building design um, in the last 50 years hasn't really looked at well-being um, and uh, as, a, as a priority. And I think, you know, I think that more and more and more people are using different ways of valuing built environments and there are different matrices for valuing built. I mean, there's a social indices, there's an environmental indices as well, of, of course, as an economic one. And the problem with economic indices is that they've typically been incredibly short term. What's the cheapest material I can get today, regardless of the consequences. And of course, you know, that does need to change, but changing it is complex because of, um, uh, you know, the, the, the whole interrelated series of decisions that um, you have to make and navigate when you make a building. And often budgets are really, really, really small. 
Um, and, you know, actually navigating those things is complex. And that's where the skill of a, of a designer, I think an architect comes in, is to know how to navigate through all of those conflicting um, uh, things to get the best possible outcome, to do your best in a set of, uh, um, uh, in a context which is really tricky quite often. Yeah, absolutely. Um, and I guess one, one thing I'm curious to hear from your side as well is I think as an, from an architect's perspective, it's often around how you communicate some of those benefits to, to the client of the building that you're working on or the, or of the project that you're working on. Because my, my perception is that when you're able to communicate the benefits, which are sometimes not reflected in the, in the short term price, then sometimes there is the buy-in to get those things because the client understands that maybe they do want to be living in a building that's more adaptable or more, or built with more ethically sourced materials or healthier or lower carbon. So I'm curious as to what your experience has been in terms of uh, maybe some of the ways that architects communicate those benefits to their clients in order to get the buy-in, because I think that's a big part of the responsibility of an architect these days. Yes, I think you choose your clients carefully and often we really do work with people that are really interested in pushing us and absolutely wanting the lowest carbon building with the best possible materials. And that's fantastic. I think that um, uh, I think it is really, really important to know who you're working with and feel as if you're working with people that share, um, feel as if you're working with people that share a value um, uh, system that is aligns with yours. And, and I think, um, when you work with people that don't share your values, it's really, really distressing. And, you know, we have worked with people in the past that, uh, you know, you, you fall into working with people quite often. And part of the way through that process, you realize that actually, um, they're not really interested in the same sort of things as you are. And, you know, we worked on buildings in the past, which I'm not proud of, where we've started with this principle that we're going to do X, Y, and Z. And the client then decides that they just want to do something completely different. They want to seal up the building, air condition it. And, you know, when you designed it as a passive building, and, and actually I've fought really hard at times. And, and I've got better and better at knowing who I don't want to work with because, you know, it's really distressing feeling as if you are doing something that could be better. I mean, of course, you know, it's distressing working on buildings that are causing damage, but, but actually I think, you know, part of what I talked about is this, is that, you want to work on a building that's designed in a super intelligent manner. And, you know, in most contexts, there are ways of using materials that are low carbon and naturally ventilating buildings. You know, even in the Middle East, where the climate is up to 50 degrees, we can reduce um, ambient temperatures by about 15 uh, degrees through natural ventilation, thermal mass, you know, all of those kind of things. And that's really, really interesting as well as sensible. And so working with people that don't want to do that is something that I think, you know, you, you just get better at sniffing out. Um, it, it's, it's, but I think, you know, you're absolutely right that communicating um, is a key part of what architects do. And, there's no easy way to communicate with people. But, but I think what we always do at the beginning of a project is try and work out how do we communicate best with this client? What is it they want uh, from us? How can we tell them uh, the story of the building? And, uh, and often we work with people that are super interesting and really up for you know, spending a bit of money evaluating um, what, um, what it would be to move from a, uh, a steel frame to a timber frame, where of course it's one of the biggest changes you can make in a building. And you know sometimes those decisions are quite complex ones, and you need to do a piece of work with an engineer um, and a quantity surveyor to look at those things. And investing in the design process um, is something that uh, is where you can make a, a big difference, and that's where some of the investment is is made from clients. Um, and that's in a way why architects fees, 75% of an architect's fee, as you know, is spent before you start on site. And some of that research is really essential. Um, you know, I mean, we're working a lot with round stone at the moment, and we've really had to do research to minimize 
cement, to look at freeze thaw, to look at structural stability, to look at performance. And that does come at a cost to um, the client, but um, the client understands that it's a really important thing to do. And in the scheme of the project is a relatively small cost. Um, but what it gives them in terms of the satisfaction of using material intelligently in innovative ways is immense, I think. Yeah, absolutely. Great. So I, I have one last uh, small topic I want to touch on uh, before we wrap this up. And that is around the circularity and reusability. So both, both in the way that we design buildings uh, in order potentially to enable them to be disassembled and, and have the materials be reused in the future, but also currently in any new building that we are uh, or in any building that we're demolishing, how to potentially reintroduce some of the historic practices of reusing materials that were actually in older buildings. So I'm curious as to you know your thoughts on that topic and also any any sort of examples you can share of these kind of practices happening in, in the 21st century. So I think it's obviously really important. I think the construction industry lags behind other um, design disciplines. You know, so for example, if you if you buy a car now, every bit of that car has to um, fit within a system of of um, dismantling and now typically you know, recyclability. So or, you know, you pull a cut apart a machine or a phone or a car, most of that can be recycled in a way that's predetermined, and I think. In buildings, it's far, far looser. I think that um, it's such an interesting topic. I mean, I think we're working again in the Middle East where timber is such a valuable resource that they never cut it, for example. Um, and uh, so, you know, it's really interesting to see, to walk around parts of the old town where we're working and see timber beams sticking out the side of the building. They're so valuable because they have to be shipped in from Egypt or whatever they are, that they're not cut down and they're left long so they can be reused, reused, reused and reused. And seeing that is really, really interesting. But I think um, the, the Japanese tradition of putting together buildings in a way um, where, which is really clever and really intelligent, such as using timber with timber joints, such as using timber in a way that buildings can be dismantled and reused is really, really interesting. I mean, I think some of the new technology, I mean, the reason cement is so bad in buildings is that it discourages reuse. You know, cement mortars are terrible because they don't breathe, but also um, they're very difficult to, to clean off a building to allow it to be um, reused. But I think, you know, again, it's a complicated subject. And again, it depends on what the lifespan of a building is. And if the lifespan of a building is 200 years, one of the things that is really important is is um, making bits of the building that really can last 200 years, and then making bits of the building that can be developed and changed every, uh, you know, if it's um, glazing or the external fabric of the building can be changed, you know, every 35 years or whatever, you know, whatever it is. I mean, certainly speaking from my own experience, we built a house uh, 20 years ago. We didn't have much money. So our investment then was in um, the um, uh, the timber frame, which was really good quality. It was oak that came from France and would last, you know, hundreds of years. And everything else, in a way, was designed that it could be upgraded and reused, um, you know, after about 20 years, assuming we had money then. And, and so 20 years later, we did actually do exactly that. We upgraded quite a lot of the building, left the core bits of the building where our financial investment would be and upgraded those, and then use all of those materials in another building and um, in two other buildings, in fact. And the, the reusing of materials, I think, is such an interesting thing to do. And part of our you know, skill as a designer um, or part of every, everyone's job as a designer now is to wean themselves off this sense that materials can fit to any shape. The materials can fit to any shape that you predetermine, whereas actually you need to look at what your resource is and design in a manner that uses those resources um, in parallel with architecture. You know, and and I think more and more and more we're realizing that that architectural 
form isn't something that you predetermine. It comes from understanding what you have as a finite resource. And often that resource has come from a building that's been dismantled or demolished that needs to be reused in order um, for those materials to work really hard. Yeah, that's, um, I, I absolutely agree. And uh, I guess one, one thing I recently read is there's a lot of talk around how societies are very materialistic these days. And I think in the context of architecture, but also in general, in for most people, there's this, uh, this article I was reading was saying that we're actually not materialistic enough. So if we were actually materialistic and we put a lot of emphasis on the actual materials that are available and we gave them their the importance they deserve, then they would, they would shift our perception around how we do things because we actually value each individual thing. Whereas what is happening right now is we don't give that much value to the materials and to the things that are around us. So we predetermine an idea of what we want to do and we use them as kind of a means to an end. Whereas it's, it's the thing itself, which, which I think life has a lot of value. Absolutely. I, I completely um, can, can yeah, I yeah. agree. Great. This has been uh, a super nice discussion and uh, it's really great to meet you, Piers. Uh, thanks a lot for sharing all of the, all of the insights around your practice and, and your work. Uh, and yeah, hopefully other architects can be inspired to use some of the approaches that you use in your work, because I really think it's, yes. it's, thanks uh, so much, Fanos, and um, um, should be doing great to, great to meet you and speak soon, I hope. Absolutely. Yeah. Thanks a lot. Take care. That's all from us for now. So thank you for tuning into this episode of the Share Your Green Design podcast. Just a reminder before you go, you can subscribe to us over on Spotify, Apple, or anywhere you get your podcasts. Or if you prefer watching the conversation, you can find us on YouTube. You can follow us over on Instagram, LinkedIn, Twitter, and WeChat at Share Your Green Design. That's all one word, Share Your Green Design. And remember, the podcast is only one small part of a much larger platform dedicated to sustainable architecture, engineering, and construction. To keep up to date with the latest projects, news, research, events, competitions, student work, and job adverts, head on over to shareyourgreendesign.com. Thank you everyone for your support, and we'll see you next time. Thank you.